Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. Sports play an increasingly dominant role in contemporary American culture, and they provide us with myriad important and fascinating issues to explore, from concussions in pro football to the rise of fantasy sports leagues and the role of sports on our college campuses. We'll talk about at least some of these issues with my guest, William C. Roden, a longtime sports columnist with the New York Times. Bill, good to see you. Hey, Bob. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. I appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. So um, let's start with um, football, America's most popular sport. Uh, it's a cliche to talk about how violent football is, but I think it's even more violent than most fans realize. We hear a lot about concussions, but talk to us a little bit about the, the injury issue in pro football across the board. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Bob. And by the way, man, thanks for having me on. It's, it's really great to be uh, to sharing the table with you. Not a problem. Uh, Former miss, colleagues we, yeah, at the we Times. We miss, miss you, man. <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, yeah, you, I, and I thought about I mean, I've been covering football for a long time. And I like, I mean, I, 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 I like the sport, play the sport. Um, so that's my disclaimer. Mm -hmm. But the the the... the, the the injuries, I mean, the concussions are one thing. Right. I mean, concussions, they've been having concussions since Newt Rockney. Right. But the, the, the injuries have just been phenomenal this year. Uh, I was up in Buffalo Sunday, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that with my <laughs> Jets. <laughs> but Jet fan. Jets talking about disclaimers. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, but that's, that's always good. They're always fascinating. <laughs> but, um, you know, Muhammad Wilkerson broke his leg. Yeah. Uh, shoulders. Uh, neck contusions, just, I mean, almost on every play, there'll be th th these injuries. And I'm thinking, well, is it just that I'm getting older or is it that there have just been more and more injuries than ever before? And I happen to think that, uh, it's, you know, you have a confluence of, remember, the, the dimensions of the football field have not changed in, right. I don't know, what, what, 80 years or 90 years, you know. Uh, but the people who are playing, who are still Put, we stick in this tiny space that's not grown. <laughs> right. Man, they've got guys now. I was looking at even the, uh, at the Jets game. You had Fitzpatrick who was getting chased down by guys who are like 6'4", 6'5", 300 pounds who are just like motoring. <laughs> and you've got all these people playing in this little bitty space. And so I'm thinking that maybe what's happened as the game continues to get just more ferocious, the people are getting bigger, they're yeah. getting stronger. But we still have them playing in this little phone booth. And maybe that's why we're just having more broken bones, more, you know. And the, the players get beat up so uh, badly that after a while, and, and I know you've seen it, you have, they, they end up with permanent injuries so that when they become uh, middle-aged, um, they're really uh, in a mess. Some are confined to wheelchairs. They've got aches and pains. They, uh, they get addicted to drugs because they take drugs for the pain. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything that can be done about it. Well, I, th well, I think a couple things. And, and this, again, I, I was at the Steelers. The Steelers, the first game that Michael Vick played with the Steelers, you know, after Ben Roethlisberger mm -hmm. went out. And I was up there for the game. And after the game, I was waiting for, I forget his defensive lineman, waiting for him to come out. And... You know, you, you're looking around and everybody's gotten six and seven ice packs here and yep. ice packs there and all that. Um, but I, I, I think that you, the question was, is there something that could be done? And there's nothing that could be done in terms of the violence. What we love about the game is the the violence. Of That's it. what the fans want to see. Yeah, that, the blood and, and, and the hard hitting. And it's... There's this skill later, and there is skill, but it's skill. But at the end of everything, is it's just a rough and tumble. Yeah. So game. a receiver that makes a remarkable catch then gets clobbered. Gets clobbered, and not gets clobbered the way it was when we first started no. watching the game back in those dark ages. <laughs> you know, remember <with> Tatum <laughs> and Ak I mean, geez, <laughs> that's literally why I decided I was going to be a defensive back. Early in my career, I must have been like uh, eight or nine because I was a defensive throughout my career. I played at Morgan and all. I said, you know what, like B.B. King said, if this is the way life has got to be, <laughs> I'm going to be on defense because I want to be able, A, I like to guard people, yeah. but I like to at least see where I was going to hit somebody. Yeah, you'll be the uh, one delivering the hit not, as opposed to the one you know, absorbing you, the yeah, hit. Yeah, catching like this, and I said, no way. <laughs> I said, if we play touch, I'll be a receiver. But in this stuff, no way. But, but just, you asked the question, uh, 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 is there anything that could be done? Right. And nothing can be done about the violence, but you know going in 
that nine out of 10 times when you're 40, you're going to end up, as you said, with some type of debilitating injury. Yeah. And all that. What the NFL could do with the billions, I mean, they're printing money, with the billions upon billions of dollars, they could have homes or centers in each section of the country where, where, where former players, if they need to, permanent housing or something like that. Which really, many do. Th which they do. And, and rather than putting them in these inappropriate homes for the elderly or, or no homes at all, they could have these places in each section of the country that are well-equipped with like-minded pe people of the same age, kind of went through the same experiences, and, and they could have these places uh, in the north, south, east, west. And, yeah, it would take money to have these nice spots, but it, ta it takes so little money. Right. To, to do that. And so that's what I think they could do. I think they could do stuff on the back end to deal with an inevitability. But there's nothing that they can do to really change the essence of the sport, which is violence. So they're uh, printing money, as you say, mm. because the, for, the sport remains so popular and it's become even more popular because of fantasy uh, oh, football. Right. And you did a column recently in which you had some concerns about fantasy football. Talk about that. Yeah, yeah. in fact, I realized I never... Um, so, something always troubled me about fantasy. You know, I've got nephews who are addicted to it, and they were always into fantasy, and something troubled me. Then I realized just recently, you know, what troubles me about it is that it really desensitizes people even more to the, the brutality we right. just talked about. Mm -hmm. Because now it's fa y y what you're more concerned with is not whether somebody got a broken neck or something, but it's like, oh, man, how does, how does that broken neck affect my team? Right, you're not concerned yeah. <laughs> really about the not, neck. Not, you're like, oh, you're man. concerned about the stats that are lost. Yeah, can you go? And I've heard more about that, even in the press box. Oh, man, I had this guy on my fantasy team. And you've got people who are cheering. They may be lifelong Jets fans. Yeah. But they're cheering against the Jets because their fantasy guy is playing against, you know, against the Jets team. So I just think that what fantasy does, and I actually spoke to Jonathan Stewart, who's a running back for uh, Carolina, the Carolina Panthers, yeah. and he said the same thing. He said, man, you know, we just become more so than ever, we just become these sort of incidental chits, you know, these, and, and people don't really, less than us really care about us and the injury, they care about how us and the injury affects their fantasy team. And so I just think that fantasy uh, takes us further and further away from the reality right. that we just discussed, which is that it's a, it's a very brutal game. The, it, you know, it, tur it turns football into cartoon violence. You know, mm -hmm. like, I would say like the road runner. Exactly. We, you could drop the safe on him. You know, you <laughs> these can, aren't real people. You know, uh, next scene. Okay, here he comes again. <laughs> and the same thing. You know, uh, Wilkerson goes down with a broken leg or is down, and we're just waiting for him to get up. Yay! You know, where where in reality, this is a real broken leg. Speaking of Mohammed Wilkerson of my New York Jets, I have been a Jets so, fan for the longest time. I did a commentary saying, telling parents, don't let your children grow up to be Jets <laughs> fans. You know, they're only going to be disappointed. Right, right. So we're disappointed again this year. Yeah. But they had a better year than last year. Todd Bowles is the new coach. My right. question to you is, if mm. you can answer it, is mm. Todd Bowles for real? Is he, is he the real deal? He's, he's, yes, he is to the extent that anybody could break this curse. <laughs> the Jets are cursed. It's a cursed, a cursed franchise. It's a cursed franchise. franchise. I don't know if it's the Matt Snell curse. <laughs> and people, if they don't know Matt, go back and Google it. But whatever reason, they, they had a ring of honor ceremony for him just a couple months ago. Yep. And once again, he refused to show Matt up. Matt was not there. He was not there. And I'm saying, oh, that's why. The word I got was that Joe Willie and the Jets sold the team sold to the devil in return for Super Bowl three, and they were never going to win again. We're now approaching Super Bowl 50, but nevertheless. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, so, so having said all that history, <laughs> can Todd Bowles, can Bill Betts, can, can anybody right. break this curse? I mean, I, I'm impressed with, with Todd uh, because uh, he, he's a really solid guy. He's a brother. You know, right. he's a very solid guy, straight shooter. Uh, one of the things I like, you know, we went through, what, five, eight years of Rex Ryan. Yeah. And Rex was the whole boisterous selling I think, wolf I think tickets. Not quite eight, but, but go ahead. It was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a lot of Rex. And it was good for us. He was very boisterous and all that. Todd, exact opposite. Low key and all that. My only concern is that 
sometimes in, in football is a very an emotional game. It's a very emotional game, yep. and there comes there come there comes a time when you really have to ratchet it up. Mm -hmm. And I never saw Todd. Now again, you could argue, well, why is he going to ratchet up in front of you guys? But I never saw him ratchet it up, even during press conferences. Get the players all pumped up, ready for the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I was thinking, uh, uh, you know, you go into Buffalo, and, and a few players said that we just came out flat. Yeah. And normally that's sort of the kiss of death that points to the coach when you come out flat for a huge game. I mean, that was right. that could have been the defining game of a of a, of, of Bowles' first. This last game of the season the against game. the Buffalo Bills in Buffalo. In Buffalo. In right. other words, the, the, the week before, they get a gift. They, they, they get a gift. I know. Right? They, they, they beat New England. Uh, they beat New England, but more importantly, uh, Belichick the, the made Ravens, the wrong the, the call. Ra well, the Ravens beat oh, Pittsburgh. Oh, beat Pittsburgh. Yeah, Pittsburgh the lost. Yeah, So, exactly. so now the Jets are thinking, because even had they beaten uh, New England, but Buffalo. Uh, but uh, but Pittsburgh had won. Red, the Jets still would not have had a yeah. so, so here you're looking at this. And, wow, the door is <laughs> wide open. So I'm saying, okay, this is either going to be the same old Jets or they're going to actually take this right. gift as a referendum. Same old Jets or not. So what happens? You know, they come up there, they have every, not listen, Bob, I, not meaning to depress Jets fans anymore. <laughs> In my mind, they had a picket fence to the Super Bowl yep. because if they had to play Cincinnati, Cincinnati doesn't have Andy Dalton. If they had to play Denver, Denver's got a beaten up. I mean, Peyton Man yep. is, is nowhere. If those had, injuries that we're talking about, the, those injuries yeah, over the course of a career. A fused neck, <laughs> he's played yep. with a broken neck. If they have to play Kansas City, you know, uh, average quarterback. I mean, the only person they'd have to sort of really deal with was probably New England, at the, and New England's beaten up. Yep. So I'm looking at this and said, wow, it, could it really be that these guys have this picket fence? And the Jets had shown that they could beat New England. And here they go. They go to <laughs> Buffalo, and, you know, they... Yeah. So you wrote a book a few years ago called The $40 Million Slaves, mm. The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of the Black athlete. Mm. And that's sort of to trace the history of the black experience in big time sports mm. in the United States, which really hasn't been, I know for young people it seems like forever, but it really hasn't been that long a time. No. Um, talk a little bit about the theme of that book. The, 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 the theme of the book, the essence, there are a lot of different things, but the first one is power. Mm -hmm. Is power. How do you get power? How do you use power? Particularly in the one area of, of endeavor where African Americans really have a lot of visibility and a lot of potential power. They certainly don't have, like in our industry, we're always used to this minority presence. In journalism. In, ju in, in journalism. I mean, I go to press boxes in 2015. I was at the press box, uh, I was down at the Cotton Bowl, or the Orange Bowl, rather, uh, in Miami, where Clemson was playing, uh, uh, Clemson was playing Oklahoma. And at one point, Bob, at one point, there were like three white guys on the field at one point. 22 guys, at one point, there were just three white guys in the starting unit, mm -hmm. three. Everybody else, Clemson, Oklahoma, all these young black guys. But then I'm turning around in the press box, in a press box of about 150 people, there were maybe two of us, maybe two black writers. Uh, look at the coaching staff, the cheerleaders, yeah. the, the, the people doing all the PR stuff, the media, stuff like that. The only black presence there, any significant black, was on the field. And I think that's the NFL, the NBA. Uh, so the question becomes, when you've got an NBA that's almost like 97% of the players, 80, 80 to 90% of the players are black. Mm -hmm. NFL, you know, routinely about 70 to 80% of the players are black. What does that mean? I mean, what does that really mean yeah. if, you, if you're not going to come together and say, okay, this is what this black presence means. We're going to uh, build banks or we're going to use our, our, our leverage to make sure they're more blacks in the press box or, or put black engineer, which is something. But right now, and this is, what, this is what the book was about, is that we evolved. You know, when you and I first started watching sports, probably you did the same thing. We'd cheer for the team with the most black players. <laughs> oh, we'll cheer for so-and-so. Now we've grown to the point where you've got this great black presence and potential power, but, but the power really hasn't been realized. Well, you mentioned in one of the points you made in the book was that when sports, um, were, when big-time sports were integrated in the United States, 
you had the athletes come into the NBA and the NFL and Major League uh, Baseball, and then, of course, they flourished mm -hmm. um, in a way that people, I think, didn't even imagine at the time. But you didn't get the coaches, you didn't get the owners, you right. didn't get the accountants and the lawyers. Right. Um, so uh, why was that? Why, why was there not a broader black presence? And why is more not being done about it now? I think, I think a lot of it is a brainwashing. I've, I've, I've been reading this book again by Tom Burrell, uh, a book called Brainwashed. Mm -hmm. And he talks about this whole idea of sort of brainwashing, of thinking if you're a black person, thinking that, well, you know, they kind of brought us over here to tote that barge, lift that bell. They right. did that. And you know what? That's still what we're doing. That's we're, what we do. That's, that's, that's what we do. We could be 80% of the NBA, whatever, but our job is to make white people rich. Our job, for example, you know, where I thought you were going with that, you know, I went to Morgan State. Mm -hmm. And during a large period of time, and you had all these incredible black athletes at these black schools at Grambling, Jackson State, you know, all these schools, particularly in the South, because... They were not, the white schools weren't drafting them. Finally, Bear Bryant was saying, you know, they realized they couldn't win any games because all these other schools up north were beginning to desegregate Minnesota. They said, you know what, if we're going to be successful, we got we to gotta get black guys. And all of a sudden, what had been this, these powerful black institutions in terms of these teams, all of a sudden were neutered because now instead of them going to uh, Grambling, they were going to LSU instead of going to Texas A. You know, and so get, to get back to your point, and it really is not just sports. I mean, we're talking about sports, but you could ask this question. <laughs> I, I agree. And as you have yeah. more broadly, what is it? What is it about our collective mentality that a we don't see a collectivity anymore, and b the, the backbiting, the undercutting seems to be more virulent now than it ever has been before in our, in our history here. And the opportunity is so great. I mean, the athletes are making so much money. I mean, you, you know, you, you talk about $40 million slaves. I mean, right. you know, you have these. But these are, are young guys. Uh, a lot of them have, uh, come out of uh, very poor backgrounds. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is um, not just that they don't see a way forward where they can build the power that you're talking about, but a lot of them aren't even um, taken care of well on their on their own in, in their in their own lives. So you have these fellows who end up broke. Um, you have these fellows who get uh, addicted to uh, drugs, who get in trouble. Um, who should be looking out for these? I, I mean, I know they're men, but they're like in their early twenties. To me, they're still kids. Who should be looking out for these well, see, kids? Again, I think that does feed back to, to the black institutions because I think a lot of times you, do, you did have, because you had these elders, you know, the Eddie Robinsons, who, who they had this journey and they knew... Coach at Grambling. Yeah, the coach at Grambling, or, you know, my coach, coach, you know, you had these older black men uh, who knew what the struggle was about. And, and so I think that, uh, and, and again, you ask, what about you know, $40 million slaves, why did I write it? A lot of it was just a history lesson because what you, at one point, uh, right in the, uh, I, was, I was speaking to a group of uh, sixth graders, and at one point, uh, this is like Black History Month, you know, and so a, 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 little, a young girl raised her hand and said, okay, Mr. Roden, that's all well and good, but who was the first white player to integrate the NBA? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so at that point, I had the same reaction. <laughs> At that point, I realized, you know what? It's funny, but it makes sense. Yeah, because of course. Because at that generation, a lot of these kids grew up in a, they grew up where the NBA was 80% was black. They yeah. thought it's always it's been always that It's always been black, and at some point, whites began to come into, into the NBA. Right. So she says, <laughs> but, but when you think like that, what that means, tells me, is that when you have no sense of the struggle and the battles that it took to make it like this, yeah. then you just have no sense of where you fit in the ongoing battle. There is no battle because it's always been like this. In other words, it didn't evolve to this. It's just like this. And I find out with a lot of, um, of young people, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of young athletes who have either read $40 million, slave, somebody gave it to them. A couple guys, I mean, I'll go, it, it, they'll come this, man, I had, man, I had no idea. Yep. I had no idea. But once you have an idea, now all of a sudden you have a sense of mission. So, oh, now I understand. Uh, that it's a relay race. Yeah. You know, our our role now at our stages, at this stage of our career, 
is basically we run pretty strong legs, and now it's time to kind of hand it back, uh, hand it to the next generation. And I think two things are happening. There are people in our, they don't want to, they don't want to hand the baton. They want to just keep running. I said, man, yeah. you got to, you got to, you got to hand the baton. You At just some can't, point, yeah, right. you just can't keep, <laughs> you just fall, you, you know what I'm saying? You have to hand the baton back yeah. to that next generation of young black folks. And then, so it, it, it's, uh, I don't know, man. I mean, it, it I, I do have a sense of uh, hope, but I think that people do have, they have to understand, well, who is Bob Herbert? You know, who is Bob Herbert? Where did Bob Herbert come from? Who is Bill Roden? Who right. are people like, you know, I mean, you have to understand how this stuff evolves. And it requires more thought than I think a lot of people are giving it um, right now. You mentioned the number of black players at the uh, college bowl game, um, which brings me to the issue of college sports in general. How did it happen that college became the minor leagues for the NBA and the NFL, which is to me a, an incredible windfall. Oh, yeah. So you don't have anything comparable to that in Major League Baseball. They've got their own minor league. Which, which is teams. why. Yeah. So wh why is that? How did that happen? Um, that, that, that's a that's a good question. It just sort of evolved because remember, you know, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, the big thing was not the NFL or the NBA. College. Football. The big thing was college football. That was a big right. thing. But then as, as the professional thing emerged, and remember, everybody was really focused on college football and college basketball. So as this, you know, as, as pro football emerged, it just made sense that a lot of these guys who've been the stars of the, in fact, it goes all the way back to. Um, so the talent was originally developed at the college, at the college level. It was always yeah, developed yeah, there. Yeah. And then, then uh, you know, you had like uh, Wizard White and, and uh, Red Grange. Red Grange, Red Grange yeah. was sort of the first one, you know. So as, as the pro game emerged, it just made sense that you'd have the high-profile college guys that would be getting paid tons of money to now make this pro game visible. And then as TV came in and TV money, so there was always a nice farm system relationship that has worked perfectly, has worked perfectly <laughs> for, I mean, for college. But now, this is why... This is why there aren't that many black guys in Major League Baseball anymore. Uh, and this gets into a, a longer theory that is probably another show. But in, in, in pro basketball and football, there's a direct, in other words, it's, it's talent driven. You've got to go right from University of, uh, you know, of Arkansas right to the pros. Right. Uh, basketball, NBA, right from Duke, right to the NBA. There is no little minor league. In baseball, what happens? You go from whatever your college program is, your high school, then you go to the minor leagues. A ball, yeah. double A, triple A. That's where people can get weeded out. Where in the NBA and NFL, there's really no weeding out process. Whatever, whoever you are, you could be uh, the Malcolm X or whatever, if you can play, then you're going to go right from, right from college right to the pros. In baseball, they said, no, 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 we're going to get you, we're going to put you in this middle passage. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put you in A ball, yeah, double A, and we can start weeding out troublemakers. You know, now if you're extraordinary, then yeah, you'll reach. You finally, you'll survive A, double, triple, and you won't get that big money real fast like you no. like you will you in have the to NBA kinda, yeah. or in the uh, NFL. Uh, I'd love to talk more, but we're running out of time. Uh, maybe if you if you'll agree, <laughs> uh, you'll come back. Bill Roden, thank you so much. Oh, it's I appreciate been a pleasure. It. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. The hourly minimum wage for tipped workers in the state of New York has been increased to $7.50. It's a modest increase, but the big shots in the restaurant and hospitality industries are freaking out. In their cold-hearted view, $7.50 an hour is much too much to pay these workers. An official with the New York City Hospitality Alliance told the Wall Street Journal it's really creating quite a crisis in the fine dining industry. Keep in mind, $7.50 an hour is a pittance even with tips, and yet the fine dining industry is in crisis because they have to pay their hard-working employees that pittance. 
Restaurant owners are howling all over the place that they can't afford this new minimum wage. Well, here's a news flash. If you're in business in New York or anywhere else, you have to be able to pay your rent, your electric bill, and other elements of your overhead. And you have to pay for your supplies and so on. Most people would say that if you can't afford to meet those bills, you can't afford to be in business. The same is true when it comes to paying your employees. These are human beings we're talking about. If you really can't afford to pay them a decent wage, you have no business being in business. That's all for now. See you next time.